Aloha and welcome to Faith in Politics, where we aim to discuss politics through the lens of faith, both here in Hawaii and around the world. I'm Brennan Scarborough, your host. In this program, how are we liking the gas and energy prices? If you're anything like me, I'm sure you feel the pinch financially. Mac McKeithen discusses this hot topic on the crisis around the world, including Hawaii. We hear from Laura Burbage of One Impact, a grassroots movement educating churches and believers so that their vote isn't based on who's more popular or who does more sign waving. Instead, they aim to give voters a clear understanding on the character of the candidates, as well as their stance on issues that's important to conservative Christians. But first, we start this episode with part two of a conversation on a new documentary released about Black Lives Matter and the donations raised. Mac McKeithen, Leo Rodas, and Pete Klaproth continue discussing the film and its implications. Let's join in on the conversation. And as we're filming this, there's a new documentary called The Greatest Lie Ever Sold, and it premieres this week. And again, it follows the money, and we see what really is actually going on. So guys, let's watch the trailer, and then we'll discuss it. Sounds good. So Black Lives Matter released their 990 IRS filings. They collected $80 million. Where is that money? It's not here. Everything looks worse than it was. Where have you seen that money impacted throughout the city? So my producer just sent me a link. It is just shocking to me because of how much money was raised to think that where he lived, the bills weren't being covered. Super frustrating, but that's a dead end, so. And here's where it gets really interesting. Ready for some BLM pride? Another 200K went to escorts, BDSM workers, strippers, peep show workers, phone sex operators, and webcam performers. And then at that moment, it became personal. And I thought, not only am I going to say the truth, <laughs> I am going to scream the truth louder than you can scream the lies. So Leo, if we look at racism today in America, it seems like they're trying to divide America. Right. What, what do you think is their play? You know, and I guess we're talking about the elites. You know, like you said, we're talking about it even now, and it seems like it's division. It is. It's to keep but us- But why divide? Why, yeah, go on. Right, right. So to keep us at, at each other's throats, essentially, um, to see one another as, as you know, like uh, even like those pronouns, like the, the whole idea of, of they versus like them and and we versus you and, and all this stuff. It's to always have um, essentially like like a dagger at each other's throats. Mm. That allows for, um, for these positions of power, these power vacuums to open up mm. and for- like what Mac was saying earlier w with regard to um, who's actually pressing this narrative, we see in the documentary, um, there's a CEO that comes out in the film who loses his job, loses his position, because his st the statement that he released at the, at the heels of the George Floyd death um, didn't necessarily you know, placate um, the uh, that that particular side, the side that was pushing this mm. narrative, and he says it himself. He's like, "This is coming from Silicon Valley. That's where it's coming from. From these mechanisms that control the media, the mm. social media, the airwaves, all that sort of thing. It's like that's where this is coming from." And you say, "Okay, well, there's um, you know the transgender ideology. There's this whole pride movement. We're seeing it this weekend here in Hawaii um, with the with the march." is that they're pushing this agenda from one hub, from Silicon Valley. Look at our youth, they're on TikTok, they're on Instagram, they're on Snapchat, they're seeing these things. Mm. Even when you pull up, um, say, one of these apps, you pull, pull the app up and it'll tell you what's recommended for you. How's that? It plays on this narrative of how you should think, of how you should feel, and what your response needs to be, mm. right? And so, yeah, so th this, yeah. Is, this is where it's headed. Mac. This is going to be, a, some people will really not like this question, but I want to ask you, do you believe BLM is a criminal enterprise? So the short answer is, and hear me out here, criminal enterprise, it can't be because they state on their website what they're about. Mm. 
You, you understand what I'm yes. saying? So the website tells you exactly what they were they're going to do from the door, and none of it stipulated how they were going to impact the black community in a positive way. So for that cause, they're not. They're just a very clever empire, right? Organization who have duped the black people with the slogan. Mostly, you know what I'm saying? I don't think it's, it's, no, no, it's black. I'm just saying it's mostly. Every, no, everybody. I think it's everybody. Well, yeah, yeah right? I mean, think about it. I want to say they played on, on the black community. Yes. So let me let me be yeah. more specific. They yes. played on the black community. They used the black community. Yeah, to use race. Right, right sure. exactly. And now, you know, and everyone fell in line with the slogan as the black community, you know, yelled and screamed it out because the slogan is not the issue. The issue is the organization behind mm -hmm. the slogan. Mm -hmm. And they say inside of their their uh, website, on the website, um, whether it's past what they've said, it doesn't change their ideology. It stays the same. What they said in the beginning is what they are today. Hmm. And they could change all the verbiage up, but anyone that looked at them know exactly what they're about. So for that cause, it can't be criminal. They right. never said what they were going to do positive. Everything they said in there was destructive. And you know, the, the, the biggest thing that blows me away is that the church fell right in line. Oh my that. goodness. There are pastors that, you know, that they were duped as well. In the documentary, they talk to the pastor from that neighborhood. That's right. Right? And they get his thoughts on it. And like, it's, wow, it, it makes you take a step back because he, even even he's like, they brought George Floyd out to be this martyr. And it's almost like, like churches fell in line with acknowledging that this is like the new Jesus. And the pastor there in the community is like, this is so wrong. This particular pastor in the community is saying, we're worse than we ever were. There's so many more murders and just that, what is it like unincorporated um, block or unincorporated yeah, small call, little yeah, town, a little, little community. Yeah, not even, no not even part anymore, of America. No, so yeah, speak, not yeah. part of just themselves. Right. People are getting shot at point blank, right in the street. Uh, a pregnant woman had been shot recently. He's like, this is this is unacceptable. Yeah, that's what happens when lawlessness, lawlessness comes yeah. in. But I mean, when you go to the church, the church had no business at all siding with anything. So, you know, that's that's the number one problem. Churches don't get involved in social issues. That's 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 not the church's. Well, that um, goes against what a lot of churches are believing. Well, explain yourself. Well, so the scriptures are, are clear. We should not be subject to change. We don't join those who are subject to change. We can stand up for for things. That's not that's not the case. But we don't go out there and and and, and join for especially especially when anything that they are about goes against the character of God, or if anything that they're doing goes against God's word, and so. We shouldn't even align ourselves. We can announce things in, in a way that is strictly biblical without getting into this, you know, secular environment and doing things the way of the world. That is not the church's design and we should abstain from any of those activities. Mm -hmm. There's a way to promote um, um, justice, biblical justice, and, and that's the only way we should look at it. We shouldn't align ourselves with social justice because that definition does not comport with the scriptures. What I've experienced with, with ministries and pastors, there were guys that, pastors that totally stood up for it, went down to the march. I'm sure because they just didn't know. And like you said, I think the biggest problem here is people are not taking the time to educate themselves and really see what the truth is behind all of this. You know, I've I've had pastors, uh, the funniest one I saw, and I won't mention a name, where he said, you know, if you don't have a, a black friend, you should go out and get one. How, that just sounds Whoa. ridiculous, right? And I wanted so badly to respond in his thread and say, hey, pastor, can you find me a few black friends? I, you know, that'd be great. You know, <laughs> I mean, what does that sound like? I mean, that just sounds incredibly racial. I mean, well, you talk about division. There's a purpose for it, in my opinion. America could never be destroyed without. It's going to be within. Right. And the easiest card to play is racism. That has always worked. Yeah. And it will always work so long as people don't investigate, take the time to look at the narrative for what it is, educate themselves and and not become full of feelings and emotions, but use facts and the reality of the matters to, to um, sway the decisions. But until you get that, this card will always be played. And if I'm the enemy, I'm going to play the card all the time. Absolutely. And it is powerful. Like I mentioned earlier, it really hit me when I was called a racist. And yeah, I knew I wasn't. Yeah. I mean, there was no way that I ever was. And yet it nailed me, right? Yeah. You, it really hits you emotionally. Well, it, it pays too. This this is a, a huge industry. Racism mm. is a industry. It's a business. Mm. That's what it's become. And people are getting paid to, to promote this narrative. You have race hustlers all around. Look at them on YouTube. They... they 
champion any racist thing and he asked, please send me all everything that's racist. And again, I say racist and I, I specifically say it that way because according to many, only only black people cannot be racist, right? Right. The dictionary now has changed the definition of right? racism. Yeah. It says a prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism um, directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group. That's good. And then it ends it with this. Typically, one that is a minority or marginalized. So what are you looking at now? It's, you, you, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. What they're doing is instead of just ending it there, no, it's, it's typically those ones who are minorities. Right. And this comports with critical race theory. Right. And then goes back to, oh, if you're white, you're privileged. Because yeah. I'm the one that's always going to look be looked upon and, and given have a racist tone towards me. Hmm. And and again, it's it's money. It yeah. pays a lot of money today. Hmm. And until people wake up, those who are money hungry and race hustlers are going to use this to the end of time. Hmm. What do we do? As a community of believers, how do we deal with this? Suggestions? I mean, biblically. Of course, that's the short answer. But what does the Bible say about it? Being, we don't respect, God is not a respecter of persons. We should follow the suit. We're a respecter of character. And see, that's going out the window. Character means nothing today. It's all about an agenda and an ideology. So we need to toe the line. And we need to continue to stand firm on God's word. And we need to understand that we're all of one blood, one race, the human race. Amen. And so all the color thing and, and all that, God sees it because he made us all these different tones. They're beautiful. And there's no problem with that in and of itself. No, no question about it. The problem comes when we make it a problem. And that's been the issue from the door. We have made this an issue and it should not be at all. You know, it's so sad. We live in America, but I don't know of anyone who could define what an American is. Everyone has their own little thing instead of us having a definition of what is an American instead of being free and dumb. Do we have a definition that defines us, you know, as a unit, solid, you know, to, to, to start from that foundation? But we don't. We've changed it all. We fractured everything. And now everyone has their own little world. And we're trying to make everybody their own kings and queens. It doesn't work that way. It falls apart. Yeah. And, and the big play is really to destroy America. America from within. And, yeah, exactly. And, and racism will be used as one of those key components. Yeah, we've become weak. Absolutely. Yeah. I know that as a person of faith, I can't be defined by uh, man's constructs. Mm. I'm defined by what the word of God says. I'm defined by his perfectness, right? And so if, if you know, we can all... Uh, agree that once we clothe ourselves in Jesus, then we are this new creation, then all this this world, this 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 ideology of racism and 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 bigotry and discrimination should pass away. Right? So it's really important for us to see that and acknowledge where the division starts so that we can be part of part of the change there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes back to what you were talking about, America. We've kind of lost our identity. Right. And when you yes. think about it, the, the thing that really bothers me is what's happening in the whole transgender world, that they're they're allowing kids to make that decision. Right. You know, kids being confused about what? About their identity. And, and that's what I see, not only in America, but individually as a whole. And as Christians, what our identity in, is in Christ. I think for a lot of people in the faith community, I don't, I don't know if that's if people understand what that is yet. Maybe, I mean, I'm not saying everybody, but obviously that's a problem. Yeah, you know, well, we talked a little bit about following the money mm -hmm. earlier. And so when you do that, especially when, with regard to this film and what BLM has done, when you follow the money, you realize that they're buying homes, they're buying real estate. Right. And so you ask the question, right? I'm scratching my head, why? What's going on? They're developing these homes that they're labeling as retreat centers. They call them zero barrier housing for people in transition for kids to be able to go to these homes. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, it should start to, again, right. ring out in our head, like what's going on to become something that, that God didn't intend that's for right. them to do. Right. And, and that's not okay. No. So again, we've got to follow the money here. We've got to follow what truth is telling us. You know, when you fill out those forms, especially the, the governmental forms, and there's the question race, what race are you? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, they didn't have Dutch and Indonesian. That's what I am on the list. So guess what I had to other? take off? Other. Yeah. And I think maybe if we got rid of everything and just put other there, 
our race has nothing to do with yeah. who we really are. It's our identity is really in Christ as a believer. Yes. You know, I know who I am. I know that I'm saved by grace, by his mercy. And that's the most ultimate thing that any any person of any color, of any nationality can have. Yeah. Would you agree with that? No, I, de I definitely agree. But again, it's just so sad because racism is a, such a powerful tool and weapon to utilize mm -hmm. um, right. that to, and evil is st still in the world. And it's not going to go anywhere. So you're always going to have racism no matter what. Mm -hmm. To the extent of what they're pushing, absolutely not. It doesn't exist that way. In fact, that's why you see all these hoaxes. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the, the demand for racism is outpacing the, the supply. There's, there's not enough. And you, there's so many race baiters that, that film things in these short, like, 30-second clips. And, and you look at it and be like, oh, man, that's so racist. And then you, you find the whole story out. You're like, what are they doing? They're just trying to bait you. So before people get them, they, they play on the emotions of people. They know that that's the key. And racism is a trigger, you know? Well, well why are people doing that? Why are people using it? What Are they trying to uh, lift themselves up? Well, not only do they lift themselves up, but like I told you, it's a business. They get paid to do this. Mm. They're looking for followers and subscribers, and they can care less about the division. Once the money starts hitting, that's what they want. And also the position and, and to be out on the forefront and to make themselves into something that they, they never would be without racism. Special thanks to Leo, Mac, and Pete for that discussion. You're watching Faith in Politics. We'll be right back. I started as an intern at Kala TV, and today I'm working full-time running quality control as well as editing. Being a small team, I learned everything from camera work to editing to broadcasting, with the focus on spreading the gospel, being the only local Christian TV station in Hawaii. Our vision is big. That is why I want to ask you to consider being a part of the team by supporting us. Imagine that. Working together, broadcasting aloha across Hawaii. Thank you for your financial support that empowers Kalo TV. Welcome back to Faith in Politics. With the general election just weeks away, how should you vote? Laura Burbage of One Impact educates churches and believers so that your vote isn't a popularity contest and gives you the information that you want to know about. Here's Laura. When it comes to voting for the most important office in the United States, the president, Hawaii has been dead last in voter turnout since 1992. That's 30 years of being in last place. And it's no different for state elections either. Data for the August primary shows only 25% of registered voters turned out for the largest race in the state, the governor's race, 25%. That's horrible. If you listen to people, though, they are fed up in one way or another with what's happening. Pick a subject, rail, housing, economy, etc. But in their anger, they respond with apathy by not voting. Well, how can we tell? Well, the cycle repeats itself every election, and that is why we have the same politicians in office for 30 to 40 consecutive years. Thus, the framework for discussion becomes this. One, Hawaii is the grand prize winner for poor voter turnout. Two, change doesn't occur because many people don't vote. Three, nothing has changed for many decades. Sounds dismal, right? Well, here's the good news. We are breaking the cycle. One Impact Hawaii is responding to the call to educate churches, believers, and those who are like-minded about issues affecting our lives, our families, our culture, our convictions, and we are here to do something about it. Our survey shows that people do not vote because, one, I didn't know enough. Two, why bother? Three, it takes too much effort. Four, I forgot. So people don't vote because they lack confidence and it seems too hard. Well, we believe it is because people are uninformed. That's why we hold educational and informative events that empower people with knowledge and wisdom to confidently cast their vote, such as information on candidates and their voting records. We've had economics and civics classes, school curriculum and parental rights. And for military families living here, consider voting in Hawaii, where your family will be most impacted right now. So One Impact is a faith-based group filtering information through the lens of the Bible because we want conservative voices standing up and fighting for our God-given and constitutionally protected freedoms. 
Our hope is to instill confidence in you to vote by taking the time to educate and mentor you. This is our moment to break the cycle for ourselves and our children. Join us at our next event, a voting party. Bring your ballots, be informed, get ideas, and together let's collaborate. Thanks, Laura, for that report. Be sure to visit their website and get educated before voting on November 8th. Next up, are you frustrated with the rising prices of fuel and energy? Mac McKeithen reports on that issue that affects us all. Here's Mac. Not too long ago, we discussed the impacts that the war between Russia and Ukraine was having on gas prices globally. And during that segment, we looked at several key factors, with one of them being Russia's role in OPEC Plus, as well as the Nord Stream 1 pipeline that was in reduced status, causing an even bigger crisis. Well, the crisis continues, and I'm afraid that things are probably going to get worse for most of us. Let's begin with OPEC Plus. Recently, they have decided to cut fuel production by 2 million barrels of oil per day. And it does not take an expert to recognize that this will increase gas prices at the pump. So the question is, how much of an increase will we see? The answer, if this was the only factor, the increase would be minimal, but this is not the only factor. And we should know that it is not the only reason by the way Washington is responding to this decision. Saudi Arabia, who is basically the leader of OPEC Plus, has been ridiculed and even threatened by the US for making the decision as well as being accused of siding with Russia in regards to the war in Ukraine. Some in Congress are calling for the ban on sales of weapons to Saudi Arabia, but they seem to forget that Saudis also get weapons from Russia. So are they siding with Russia or is what they're doing just a smart business move on the part of OPEC Plus? Either way we look at it, this should not be a concern for us if we did not have to continue to depend on foreign oil in the first place. So the aforementioned other factor that plays a major part in the decrease of oil production by OPEC Plus has to deal with the Nord Stream 2. Doubtless you have heard about the apparent sabotage of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. This issue will have ramification that seems to have not been considered at all. And if anyone thinks that the Baltic pipeline will replace Nord Stream 1 and 2, it won't even come close to meeting the demands of Europe. Again, the EU's dependency on Russian oil stood at over 40%, and those Nord Stream pipelines provided the vehicles for that supply. But now that supply line is gone and winter is approaching quickly. And even though the war in Ukraine may not be going according to how Putin may have wanted, the thought that he could be sanctioned into a position to retreat or have his oil embargoed until he submitted was a gamble that would cost more than anyone anticipated, including many here in America. This week, it was announced that New England could face blackouts this winter because of its reliance on imported liquefied natural gas. Right now, natural gas prices are sky high and will only get higher. And what's sad is we have the ability to mitigate this as well, but we have policies in place such as the Jones Act that all parties have not addressed in a way that will remove certain restrictions regarding domestic shipping services. Also, the Atlantic Coast Project has been shot down. In West Virginia, despite the U.S. being the number one gas producer in the world with major national gas resources in Pennsylvania and Ohio as well. In other words, we continue to injure ourselves as a nation because of ridiculous policies. In concert with this, China has been ordered to stop selling back its overstock of natural gas to Europe, requiring Europe to find other sellers of natural gas who by the most part won't sell it unless they're willing to sign long-term contracts for those imports. So we'll have the EU and parts of America basically fighting for natural gas suppliers who are able to meet such a demand as well as compromising on contract negotiations. So what does that look like in America as well as the EU? Consider this, electric companies in the Northeast are estimating that energy prices will be 20 to 60% higher this year. But that's not all. Those estimates are only based on a moderate winter. And think about this, what does a blackout look like during the middle of winter in New England? Well, I can tell you firsthand what a winter looks like without a blackout in New England. And it looks like it feels deathly cold, even for those who have heat. And we used natural gas the whole time from an external source that kept it full because we were living on property that the government funded. But this will not be the case for the majority living in those areas. And don't think for a moment that this has nothing to do with Hawaii. Please remember that we are looking for a new main future energy source other than petroleum, which those in power deem to be natural gas. Think about that. And please think more about what I'm about to say. And that is this. 
If we are so sure that within the next 20 to 30 years or so, we will have a, the technology to be completely dependent on renewable energy, then why can't we use that data and make decisions based on that and use the natural resources that we have today? Are we being good stewards or just being stupid? So what policies are you voting for? Addressing social and cultural issues, a Mac for Faith and Politics. Thanks, Mac, for that report. Well, that's all the time we have this week, and we hope you enjoyed this episode of Faith in Politics. This program exists because of viewers like you. We're the only local political program here in Hawaii with a Christ-centered point of view. And from all of us here at Faith in Politics, we thank you for your support, both financially and prayerfully. If you believe the content we're providing is important, please consider partnering with us. For those watching on social platforms such as Rumble or on YouTube, please like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. And of course, invite your friends to watch our program. I'm Brennan Scarborough. We close this episode with a sneak peek of a Kalo Outreach special airing soon. Namele Aloha Concert on the Big Island features legendary Hawaiian music artists and their stories of faith. Check this out. The Lord gave me this idea, this vision of doing this concert, Namele Aloha, Songs of Love to bring the community together, part entertainment and part educate. Where that inspiration came from. Some came from just looking at nature, some we heard today, beautiful love song, and then others was actually inspired by the Holy Spirit. This Hawaiian music, it really just brings back a real soulful kind of belonging. So you know the Hawaiians, we take something and we always hybrid the things like, it might be an outside influence, but we make it our own. For the hula dancer, dancing hula is what is life for them. For me, music has become what is life for me. Oh, Hawaiian music is, I would say it's, it's a feeling more than anything else. You have the hula, you, know, you have your kahiko, and then you have your awana. And without your music, awana would be really hard to come by. So yeah, music is so very important. Through the music of the family, we know who we are. So I guess Hawaiian music is identity. I'm hoping that what was shared today will help lead one or maybe many to understand that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And without that, you really have nothing. And so, yeah, that's what I see happening here today.